It's party time up in here. We're going to celebrate this morning nine years. So amazing um, as Laura and I have looked back over the last nine years. Obviously, anniversary week is that week where you're looking at old footage and realizing like, oh my gosh, I can't not believe. I'm so thankful we don't have a whole lot of footage from our Brondera YMCA days. Um, but when you look back and you, you see uh, what God has done over the years and you see people that you know, have come and gone and, and people that have been baptized and who knows where they are now. Uh, but you see the people that have been here and stayed and stuck and been faithful and rooted and planted and uh, you celebrate all that God has done in the lives and the hearts of those who call this church home. And, and man, it's been a, a, an amazing ride over the last nine years, but uh, on behalf of my wife, Laura, and I, we just want to tell you guys, thank you. Thank you. Because God is faithful. He is. But it takes a faithful people, faithful people, people who are faithful to God and and faithful to the mission to build his local church um, in order to, to make it to year number nine. And we're excited um, as we celebrate um, this morning all that God has done. But we're not here to just celebrate the past because it's really easy to look at the past and go, woohoo. I, I want us to look to the future this morning. I want to celebrate the, the past, but I want to I want to pre-celebrate this morning all that God is going to do. Because he's faithful. If he's been faithful over nine, he'll be faithful over the next nine. And that's really what this morning is about as we talk about legacy. We talk about legacy, and as I started thinking this week about legacy and what will be the legacy of Rebel Church when Laura and I pass this on to the next generation years and years and years from now, what will we be turning over? What will the legacy be of Rebel Church? And when I think about legacy, I think about churches who are in the business of rescuing people. I want our church to leave a legacy of of, of rescue. Man, that church, those people have always been about seeing the dying, the hurting, the drowning, putting out a line to rescue. And that is the title of this message this morning, A a Legacy of Rescue, because that's what I want to leave behind. How many of you guys, you, it's summer, okay, how many of you guys like to go to the beach? You like going to the beach? It's summertime, right? If my wife could live at the beach, she would live there. If you've been to the beach with her, you know. You think you like the beach? Stay from 8 a.m. till three hours after sundown hunting crabs on the beach for four or five straight days and then tell me you love the beach, right? You wonder why she's so dark? It's not because she's half Hispanic. Because she's got good skin and she likes to bake it. But a couple of years ago, we we lived in Hawaii a couple of years back. (laughs) That's a visual. (laughs) A couple of years ago, we lived in Hawaii. Actually, it's been a long, long time ago now that we lived in Hawaii. It was back in 2005. And uh, my wife lived there for four or five years back in the day when Charlie got crazy and decided to go build houses out there. And her brother, Charles, became a little surfer boy. And we got the opportunity to go back right after we got married. And, and my parents came out to visit. And they brought my 80-something-year-old Nana, and we decided to, to go to this place on the island called Hanauma Bay. Is that correct? Hanauma Bay. And Hanauma Bay is a place where tourists go. There's a lot of snorkeling going on there, and you're, you're, you're out there in this protected cove, so you don't really have to worry about, you know, the giant tiger sharks that frequent around the, the island of Oahu. And, and so we were snorkeling. And... We decided to get out, and we're sitting up on the beach there and just hanging out, chilling with Nana. 
and my parents just kind of looking at the tourists, and all of a sudden we see a commotion out in the ocean. We're like, what is going on? People are yelling, there's water flailing, there's people around, and all of a sudden people in the water start, and we're like, something's going on here. And we're sitting up on the beach, we, we see them pull out this tourist woman and drag her onto the beach, and she's got like this flamingo floaty, and it's getting serious because there's people gathered around, and they're like giving CPR, and Laura and I are sitting there. We don't know what to do other than to just pray. And I remember like the serene scene of at this beach snorkeling, and oh, it's, you know, it's Hawaiian music playing, and it's, you know, all of a sudden, there's this woman being dragged out of the ocean. She was drowning. And I remember looking around at the scene and looking behind us, and up behind us, there's a street, and there was a shave ice truck or a snow cone, raspas. They call it shave ice in Hawaii. And there were people up there munching on shave ice, and they had cameras, right? There was no iPhones back in the day. This is before iPhones. There was nobody filming. They literally had the wind-up cameras. I remember seeing them, the little yellow Kodak. How many remember the yellow wind-up Kodak cameras? My son Asher is into those things these days, right? But I remember seeing them up there, and they were taking pictures, spectating, while this woman was being given CPR on the beach. And I'll never forget that image, we had never experienced anything like that before in our lifetime. Sitting there watching someone who was drowning, being dragged and given CPR, and looking around and seeing. And I, I, I just remember that so vividly in my mind. And as I was preparing this week to talk about rescue, a legacy of rescue, that stood out to me. Because I feel like that's a little bit of a snapshot of the church. That while there are drowning, desperate people out there, you got the church sitting back, spectating, eating snow cones, looking at the commotion. But when God has actually called us, He's called us to rescue. He's called us to rescue. See, the Bible is the greatest story. Of rescue. You pick that thing up and, and you begin to read it and you find passages like Galatians chapter 1 verse 3 and 4 where Paul is writing to the church at Galatia and he says grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins. Why? To rescue us. To rescue us. When I gave my life to Jesus I was rescued when he found me I was rescued when he found you you were rescued do you know what you were rescued from you right now today if you know Jesus you have the greatest rescue story that anyone could ever tell see and here's what I found about people who know what they've been rescued from here, here's what I've come to, to understand is that those that have been radically rescued, rescue radically. Those who have been radical, those who understand this is who I was, this was my future, this is what I was destined for, and this is what God pulled me out of. He picked me up and turned me around. Come on, when, when you sing that song, when you see the people that are jumping around, he picked me up, turned me around, set my feet on solid ground. I thank who? The master, the savior. I thank God. When you see people, they've been radically rescued. They know what they've been rescued from. And if you've been radically rescued, you are called to rescue radically. And that will be the legacy of Rebel Church. And I hope to God that that's a part of your legacy.
I hope to God that you can you can say and you can look in the mirror one day, if not today, and say, this is my legacy. I've been radically rescued and I will rescue radically. I will rescue radically. See, rebel church is a rescue society. If you don't know, now you know, you know. Rebel is a rescue society. Society. What is a rescue society? Well, I did a little bit of research on rescue societies and found out that long, long time ago, up in the northeast part of the country, these rescue societies were formed. And, and rescue societies were, were, were guys and had, you know, boats. In back in the days of technology, when things went wrong on the ocean, you could not call the Coast Guard. There were no helicopters coming. There were people who, who knew the danger of someone who is in a storm in the middle of the ocean or left adrift in the middle of the ocean. And so they formed these rescue societies, and, and they, would, they would wait, and they would look for opportunity. And when someone needed help, they would take their boats and their resources and go to the rescue. And over time, little by little, these rescue societies became more of a club that was hanging out than than a crew that was rescuing. And what once was rescue societies, we now know today as yacht clubs. And you know yacht club, ain't nobody rescuing nobody. Nobody. Now, we will not be the spiritual equivalent of a yacht club. We will be a rescue society, and we will leave. Rebel will leave a legacy of rescue. What does that look like? What does a rescue society look like? What does nine years of of rescuing look like? I I could tell you. But it's much easier to show you, so turn your attention to the screen for a minute. When we showed up for that first day, it just felt like such a heavenly hug us being welcome to the church for the first time. We have found a home, we've been here three years, and we absolutely love it. From the day I decided to get baptized, I drew the bloodline with my family and made the choice to follow Jesus completely and raise my girls in a home centered around Jesus. Since that day, both of my daughters have been baptized at Rebel and my family has been completely transformed. Rebel Kids because it teaches me about Jesus and helps me understand how to follow Him. Rebel Youth has impacted my life because it helped me um, get through things I didn't think I would get through and being around people that love Jesus, I know that they can also love me because they love Him. Growth Track completely transformed me and returned what I had lost by helping me rebuild my relationship with God. It reminded me of who I am and whose I am. I learned so much about myself and it truly saved me. We loved going to Rebel U every single week. It was so exciting to get together with our community of like-minded people and just learn together and grow in our faith together. We just enjoyed it every single week. You make friends, it's fun, it's the best free day of my summer. I've been looking forward to it all year. There is something to learn from every woman at Rebel. There are generations of wisdom that encourage to live. Live like the future of our children's children will thank God, all because we chose Him first. Serving has been healing for me through my circumstances up and down in my highs and lows. 
and I want people to experience that. I want people to experience that serving isn't a task, it's such a privilege because God does such a work in us in the process of it. That's amazing. All of that is amazing. God is, is, is in the miracle working business. Like it, it is a, a miracle to see what God has done in our church, in us, and through us. But listen, we, we don't live on the history channel. We're, we're looking forward to all that, that God is going to do in this next season, in this next chapter. And I truly believe that if we're going to accomplish all that, that God has for us, we're going to have to be a people who understand that we are a part of a rescue society. We're not people who sit back and, oh, God is sovereign. He's going to do what he wants to do. You know what I'm saying? He, because while God is sovereign, he's given us free will. You and I, we have free will. God is sovereign, yes, he will accomplish that which he wants to accomplish, but you and I have free will, and God's sovereignty and our free will meet in the heart of God. And we've got a choice to make. Is that we can know God and never participate in bringing anyone to him. Or we can know God and know his fullness and know his goodness and bring people along with us. And that's what I want to take the next few minutes just to, to talk to you about. Because we know that the word of God tells us so many things. One of the things in Matthew chapter 28, it says, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Therefore, go. He didn't say, therefore, slow your roll and do it when you feel. He said, therefore, go. And the literal translation there of the word go means as you're going. It doesn't say, hey, you're sitting on the couch, now get up and go. It doesn't say, hey, you're, you're standing still, you're not moving fast, it's, and now go. No, it says, as you're going. What does that tell you? What is Jesus trying to say? As you're going, he's trying to say, brothers, sisters, children, get your as in gear. Oh, why'd your heads pop up like that? It's right there. Get your as, as you're going. Get it in gear. In other words, as you're going to school, take Jesus. As you're going to work, take him with you. As you're going to the store, as you, wherever you're going, as you're going, Jesus goes with you. Why? Because you've been radically rescued and you're looking for somebody to rescue radically. As you're going. Wherever you're going. Whatever you're doing, God's called you and he's called me to take him with you. See, this right here is what's called a life ring. I was in Idaho, as you guys know, a couple of weeks ago, got on a boat. We fished for two days, eight hours a day, a lot of fishing. That's why I'm still red in my face, but nowhere else. And when I got on the boat, for the first time, you know, they're going through all the checks. I don't get on boats often, you know what I'm saying? Don't have that luxury, but it's neither here nor there. I got on a boat with a guy, and he's going through the checks, and it's life vest, and I saw one of these things on his boat, and I was like, dude, that's crazy. I used to have these at the pool when I would go to the, the pool back in the day at Lakeside. It's no longer a pool. They concreted it in, and sad day, but 
bottom line is I never saw it used at Lakeside. I've never seen one of these used. I just see them all around. You've seen them all around, right? Like they're hanging on the walls at seafood restaurants. And, but I saw it in a boat and I was like, hey, like, that's pretty crazy. Do you ever use that? And he's like, yeah, dude, more than you would think. I was like, really? He's like, bro, the lake that we're on right now, the, there's spots in this lake that are 1,200 feet. Like the U.S. Navy has a submarine like station where they test subs on this lake. Like if you fall and you're going down, you're going down. For, they ain't finding you. I was like, oh, okay, cool. Yeah, glad you have that. <laughs> it's like this, this lake right now is about 45 degrees and it's May. You come here in like February, you fall in, hypothermia. Like, okay, well, I'm, that's good to know. I'm glad you have that. But as I thought about this, this thing, I, I thought about the fact that if you really think about it, this, this is thrown out, you know, when someone is in need of help. It's made that you can toss it a great distance. There's a rope attached to it so that the person who is in need can grab on and, and they can be pulled in. But when it comes to rescuing spiritually, Jesus is the ring. Jesus is the life ring. So in other words, you could say the ring is the thing, the thing that we take with us. We take Jesus with us wherever we go. As you're going to work, I don't leave the ring at home, right? When my man gets on the lake, he's like, if you don't leave this, you might need it. And when you need it, you need it. So wherever you go, you take the ring with you. Jesus is the ring. So there are people in this room, and you hear it all the time, but let's think about it. You know, Alicia, you know people that I don't know. You work with people that I may never meet. You see people at your Boulevardy H-E-B that I will not see at my Spring Branch H-E-B. You see some of the same cashiers over and over. They recognize your face. If I walk in there, I'm just another dude. Same thing, Joe. You, you, you work for Tesla, right? And you can get me a discount on the Tesla. <laughs> Call those things to be not as though they are. But you see people because that plant's up near Austin. You drive up to Austin nearly four or five times a week. Yeah. And you see people that I will never see. And you have skills and aptitudes, Alicia, and you have character and different parts about you that God is, is giving you aptitudes and knowledge and wisdom and understanding that I don't have. And there are drowning people. We, we have a culture that is in crisis right now. Up is down, down is up, left is right. And there are drowning people splashing in the ocean, waiting for somebody to throw them a lifeline. Waiting. So I got to ask you that question. Who in your life is drowning? Have you taken the time to look around to, to see, man, do I see any splashes? Does it look like? Because people are drowning, but they're using the wrong flotation devices. Have you ever been on a plane at the beginning when the stewardess starts talking? And it's like, one of the things that the stewardess say is, in case of a water landing, your seat can be used as a flotation device, Right? I don't know about you, but if I'm involved in a water landing, I ain't trusting my seat to, to be my flotation device. Laura and I flew to Africa back in October. You remember that. We went over the Atlantic Ocean. And I'm thinking to myself, if we go down, we going down. And we're on the same plane. Oh, my God, we don't have a last will and testament. But I'm thinking to myself, if we go down, my seat, in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, I've seen the perfect storm. Do you know how big those waves are? But, but people in life, in your life, people all around you, they are using the flotation de device of, of pleasure. Just chasing after their heart, chasing after the next fix, chasing after the next skirt, chasing after the next high. Thinking that, man, if I just, mm, if I just follow my heart, I'll be happy. 
That's the worst advice anyone could ever get you. Just follow your heart. Your heart is deceitfully wicked. That's what the Bible says. Your heart was not made to be followed. It was made to be led. Your heart was made to be led. And, and, and there's so many people that are following their heart to the next high, to the next pleasure hit, to the next, to the next, thinking that it's going to make them happy. Thinking. All the while, they're splashing and drowning, wondering, how do I get to the next? Money. Money is another bad flotation device. There's nothing wrong with money. If you got it, good. If you don't, no worries. But, but if you're using money as, man, if I, just, if I can just make, man, if I can just make $100,000 a year, then we'll be, we'll be set. If I could just make a million, whatever it is, 10 million, I don't know what you're achieving or striving for. I pray that you do, and you stay in this church, and you help us build it and grow it. I'll pray all day long. There are millionaires and multimillionaires up in here, so we can, we can do what God's called us to do. Not that he, we're not going to. We're still going to do it, but it'd be a lot easier if he just blessed some of y'all. But it's a bad flotation device, and there's nothing wrong with money. But the one thing that, that rich people know, the one advantage they have, because I'm rich in Christ, but I ain't rich in my bank account. And, and the one thing that rich people know that, that I don't, and the one advantage they have over you and I, is that they already know money doesn't satisfy. They already know. So if you're, you're using that as a flotation device, well, my next job and my next move and my next step up, and if I just had more, it's a bad flotation device. And if you can't recognize and see the splashing of, of people in your life that are constantly power, whatever it is, pleasure, money, whatever it is, they're splashing around. I better hang on to this. See, while Jesus is the life ring, the ring is that thing that we need to carry with us, right? So these things are made, right, to be, to be, to be thrown. When we see, right, we toss them out. Jesus is the ring. Yes, my points rhyme this morning, okay? It's anniversary Sunday. Just trying to have a little bit of fun. Right, Jesus is a ring. We, we toss it out. But see, the hope is in the rope because a ring that's just tossed out isn't going to help anybody. It's not enough just to look somebody, you need Jesus. You need Jesus. They're probably looking, I know I need Jesus. But what the heck does that mean? What does that look like? So it's not enough just to fling Jesus in people's face. They need it. They need to know there's a Savior who loves them, who's for them. But sometimes they just need to know that there's somebody who cares enough to invest in them. Sometimes they need to see Jesus before they hear Jesus. Right? Right? My last slide, bring it up real quick, real quick. It's last. I'm going out of order here. But my last slide, it says this. It says, the rescue begins. The rescue begins when you ask, how are you doing? And you really mean it. Right? My, my, look at my brother-in-law, Jared, right here. Learn so much from him about this. Everywhere we go, right, no matter where, if we're at somewhere an extended amount of time, you can always count on looking around and be like, where's Jared? And he'll be in the corner talking to somebody who we never met, who smells like they came from a campfire, who looks like they've been up all night on a 24-hour binge, just sitting there, just having a conversation. Why? Because it's not enough just to tell people they need Jesus. You've got to show them what that looks like. And while Jesus is... He's the ring. The hope is in this rope because the rope is anchored to something. The, the hope is anchored to 
to my story, my rescue story. The hope can be anchored to the local church. The only thing that, that Jesus ever established is a community of people, whether they meet in a building or, or they meet at a park or they meet in a home. It's the only thing he ever established was the community of believers. And see, the ring is anchored to something. And, and while this, this ring is anchored, it's yours and my job to pull. To pull. Because there's power in the pool. And see, when, when I serve at Church Under the Bridge, when you serve at Church Under the Bridge, you are a part of the pool. And when you park cars on Sunday morning, you are a part of the pool. And when you have a real conversation with a cashier who looks down and out and you won't accept that everything's fine, I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Everything's good. No, really. I see it in your eyes. What's going on? Tell me what's going on for real. You're a part of the pool. I'm not just throwing Jesus out there just hoping and, well, I hope he, God, he's sovereign. I hope he does what he does. No, I got a part to play. I got a part to play. Because I know Jesus is the lifesaver. And I know that, 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 that the gospel is, is anchored to a community of, of believers who love and, and serve. But I know that I have a, a part to play. I've got a, a part. Can, can I be a part of a rescue society and, and not care about rescuing? No. No, you can't. Can you get to heaven? Oh, sure you can. Yeah, you, all day long. But if you've encountered Jesus in a real way, if you know what you've been rescued from, why would you not want to play a part in the pool? I would question if you've really been radically rescued. See, when you serve back in those kids, you are pulling. You're pulling. When you, when you park, like I, I said in first service, right? You think, oh, I'm just, I'm just parking cars, man. What does it really matter? What does it really matter if I show up and tell people where to park and smile and wave? You never know. That... There are people in this church that are here because they were burned somewhere, that they went to a church looking to find hope. Nobody talked to them. Nobody said hello. But when they came here, the first thing they got was a smile and a wave and a good morning. And we're glad you're here. And what were you doing? You were pulling. You were playing your part. See, what happens when, when, you, when, when you have the mindset, ah, it doesn't matter what I do, whether I serve or not, whether I go to Cub and help homeless, whether I give backpacks to community, whether I say hello on Sunday mornings, whether I use my vocal abilities to, to sing and lead people in worship, what happens when I stop? The rope is dropped. You think, oh, somebody else will come along. No, you have a unique gifting and a unique calling, and you might be the only person to show up at that HEB on that specific day with a heart for Jesus who can identify what's going on in that person's life and ask them the right questions that will lead them to the life ring. Oh, it's, it's, a, it's a group effort. No, it's not a group effort. It is as a whole a group effort, but it's, it's yours and my job to play a part in the pool. Colossians 1 says, it is God the Father who has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into his kingdom of the Son in which he loves. He's brought us into the kingdom of the son in which he loves. There's intimacy there. And when there's intimacy, you want to bring close, right? We just came in here and we sang songs of worship to God. We sang that new song, I saw the Lord and he heard and he answered, right? That's why I trust him. It doesn't say, I saw the Lord. And he heard, and he gave me what I want. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he gave me what I want. That's why I, no, it doesn't say that. It says he heard, and he answered. And he answers in a way that is for your benefit, whether you like it or not. And that's called intimacy, right? 
And when you have intimacy, right, in a marriage, what have you have? A man and a woman, intimacy produces what? Reproduction. You get where I'm going? Okay, if you don't, you ain't been to that class in school, you should be in kids' church right now. But intimacy produces reproduction. So if you have an intimate relationship with your rescuer who is God through Jesus, then you cannot help but reproduce what he's done for you. So can I be a part of the kingdom and not rescue? Sure you can. But I would question whether you know what you've been rescued from. I would question whether you know the gravity and the weight of what's been done for you. How selfish that is to keep it to yourself when there are splashing, drowning people all around you. See, we want to pull. Right, we pull. We pull so that we can fill up that boat. We pull because that's what we've been called to do is go, therefore, and make disciples. You cannot make a disciple if they're not in the boat. You can't, we can't make disciples. We, we, we can't do what God's called us to do if we're just focused on us four and no more. We're going to be here to glory. Hallelujah. That's what God's called us to do is to be a part, to not make excuses. Or as you might say, rescuses. Some of you got that. It's fine. I thought it was clever, but whatever. Listen, some of us, like, Pastor, I can't, like, I don't really have a part to play. You know what I'm saying? That's, that's not, not really me, like, I'm an introvert. Like, I just don't want to, I want to play it safe. I don't want to take the risk of being around some people. You know what I'm saying? I'm not, I'm a bear. People don't want to be around me. Listen, if you look at the early church, they weren't praying prayers about comfort. Lord, make us comfortable. They prayed, Lord, make us courageous. Make us bold. Help us to share this gospel, this good news with everybody we come into contact with. Maybe, maybe a rescue might be, well, you know, I'm just focused on going deep. I'll, I'll, I'll be at Rebel U so I can... Feast on another. Great. Rebel use great. Bible study is great. But, but let, me just, let me just ask you a question. Where, where do rescues happen? In deep water. You want to go deep? Lead somebody to Jesus. That's the deepest thing you can ever do. Hey, I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not against going deep and all of that. I'm, I'm not against it. But the deepest thing that you can ever do is lead someone to Jesus. And rescues happen in deep water where it's messy, where it's ugly, where you got to rely on the Holy Spirit, where you got to trust that God is leading and guiding you. But that's what a member of a rebel rescue society does. And that's who we are, and that's who we will be. I encourage you this morning as I, as I close and the band comes. I gave you the point already, and y'all didn't move. I would encourage you to write, write your rescue story. What is your rescue story? Think about it for you. Think about it. You're like, well, it's not really a rescue story. I mean, I was just in Sunday school when I was eight years old, and I ain't got really a story to tell. So I know... Her, him on my right, on my left. I know, man, they, they was bad. And, man, it's amazing what God, no. I think often too many times when telling our story, we focus too much on who we were and not enough on who God has made us now. And that's what a rescue story is all about. And, and that's what I challenge you to do as we, as we move forward in the next nine years of, of Rebel Church, as we move forward in this next year, Committed to be a people who want to leave a legacy of rescue. Write your story down. What is it, man? This is who I was. 
This is where I was. This is what I was destined for. This is what I believed. This is what God was doing in and through me. And I didn't even know it, but he found me. He threw me a lifeline. He pulled me in. And now this is who I am. And this is what I believe. And this is where I'm going. And this is who my family is. And and find that story for you. And find the words that are real and relevant and can be communicated in two minutes or less. Because your rescue story is more powerful than you would ever think or even imagine. When when you pair your part with your Savior, and those two things come together in divine motion, and you're on an elevator, or you're in a, in a line at a grocery store, or you're at work on a lunch break, or you, or you're on the golf course with Eddie, and those two things come together in this divine moment that God has been watering and watering and watering some ground and watering some ground, just looking for somebody faithful to come along and tell their story that will connect in a way that that person will know that only God could have sent you in this moment and your words have depth and they have meaning your rescue story God will use to radically rescue people who are far from him and that will be our legacy church that rescues no matter how far no matter how wide no matter how deep We know the love of God can break down any wall.